we're beginning a new series, and it's kind of a daunting challenge to talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, my heart is not to offend anybody, but to really help us through the course of this series. But as we begin today, I want you to think back to a time when you were a kid. Did anybody ever experience opportunities where you sat around outside around a campfire or maybe in a basement somewhere in the dark at night and told scary stories? Anybody ever do that in that end? You know, and usually scary stories are not founded in fact. They're generally distortions, sometimes urban legends. They're misperceptions or misunderstandings or things. And generally our fears usually are unfounded. Usually our fears are based on things that are misperceptions, misunderstandings, distortions, exaggerations, and all sorts of stuff. Well, today as we begin the series, we're calling it Ghost Stories, a not-so-spooky series about the Holy Spirit. And for my King James folks, the Holy Ghost, okay? Because why? People have heard about the Holy Spirit on occasion, but usually they have misperceptions. Usually they have misunderstandings, distortions, or uh, uh, fabrications or things that are not founded in fact. And sometimes people can kind of get wigged out on that front. And it's people, you know, or there's just generally a whole lot of ignorance when it comes to it. Listen to this fact. 75% of people who live here in the United States who describe themselves as born-again Christians, people who have a relationship with God by accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, 75% of them do not believe that the Holy Spirit is a person. That what the Bible describes as the Holy Spirit, they believe is a force or a way of describing the power of God in operation. It's a symbol or a sign of God's miraculous power. There is so much ignorance when it comes to these issues. But you see, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, he's the most misunderstood, most neglected, and the most forgotten member of the Godhead. You see, people come into Christianity, they hear about God the Father. And yes, they hear about Jesus Christ, but how often do they hear about the Holy Spirit? And another question I have is this. What is, it, what is it about the Holy Spirit that makes so many people shy away? There are whole segments, whole denominations of Christ followers who never talk about the Holy Spirit. They actually believe the Holy Spirit is like that crazy uncle that shows up at your house on Thanksgiving every third year or so and kind of embarrasses everybody with their inappropriate behavior. And you kind of hope that by not talking about him or sending him a Christmas card, that maybe he won't show up and embarrass you. You know you're related to him, but you're just hoping he don't come around. Why? Why is it? Because listen to me. Can we be real in this series? You see, so many strange and weird things have been blamed on the Holy Spirit. As I began to think about through this, through this end and preparing this end, I tweeted this out on social media last night. If you're not following me, you can follow me on Twitter or on Instagram. But listen, I said this because people's response to the Holy Spirit, see, people will sense the Holy Spirit. They feel his presence necessarily. And we all are created by God, unique and different. And people have different responses, but their response to the Holy Spirit is just that, their response. It's not the Holy Spirit. Don't confuse the two. You see, there are times, and this is what I wanna help us on, because God, when he begins to move, people respond differently because God made us all different. God made us all unique. But the reality that we all got to come to is that all of us are weird. Why is that? Because we're all a work in progress. God is working on all of us. Nobody has their act together. And therefore, we all have sometimes weird ways of doing things. And often what we'll do is blame what we do on the Holy Spirit. 
Oh, I, the Holy Spirit made me do this. The Holy Spirit moved. No, we did something, what we thought we were responding to and called that the Holy Spirit. And that's why sometimes people get a little wiggy. They're like, oh, I don't know. You know, I would like the Spirit of God with all, all, without all the spooky stuff around it. And so we're gonna talk through those ends because why? The Spirit of God, we need to know why he came what his mission was, and why it's important for you and I to, to know him, to understand what he's come to do, because his ministry is essential to us. But there is, I will mention this, there is strange things that go on sometimes in the body of Christ, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And so how can you know when it really is or when it's not. I mean, people talk about all sorts of crazy things. You know, gold dust appearing, oil coming out of people, things, you know, signs and other things like this. Let me help you. Let me help you. How do they train a teller in a bank to know counterfeit money? By studying counterfeits or by studying the real? What they understand is this. The more you know the genuine and real money, you'll be able to tell a counterfeit, a fake like that. And that's what my heart is, is that you and I would know the true and genuine ministry of the Holy Spirit. So therefore you would know beyond any shadow of a doubt what is a fake. Why? Because people are so hungry for the supernatural that, all, that often they'll open themselves up to almost anything. And in the body of Christ, there's like, it's like this, it's like this great divorce that has occurred. Because among the body of Christ, there are people who say, you know what, we're biblically founded. We believe in the word of God. And then you have another group of people in the body of Christ who say, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, we want the Holy Spirit, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. And what happens often, it's like there's been a divorce, like somehow they're mutually exclusive. That some, because why? There's a lot of spirit-filled people who have absolutely no clue what the Bible says about experiences that they have. And you and I need to recognize when it comes to the supernatural, okay, not everything is God. The Bible says Satan himself can appear as an angel of light. How do you know a counterfeit? When, when Moses went with a true message from God into Pharaoh's court, what happened? God told him, he threw down his rod and it became a serpent, right? But what happened in Pharaoh's court? If you read this, I mean, the Bible's fascinating. I really encourage you guys, read the book. It's great, okay? In the book of Exodus, when he confronted the king of the Egyptian empire, Pharaoh, when Moses threw down his rod, the magicians in Pharaoh's court threw theirs down as well and they turned into serpents, so there is counterfeit and there's real. And that's what wigs out people. And they'd rather not talk about it because they don't understand. But I want to help you because here's the deal. The word of God and the spirit of God always work in perfect orchestration. It is a marriage that is made in heaven. In fact, the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. There was a great man of God who was used mightily Year, you know, in the, in the last century. You may not know who his name is, but his name was Smith Wigglesworth. And God used through him, through, and he said something in 1947 that I think is so true because he called what happened in the next few decades so accurately. He said, there will come because when the Pentecostal movement, when the, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when the working of God's Spirit began to be restored to the church in the beginning of the 20th century, he came in through that end. And then he said this, that God would move in the next few decades to move and to restore the message of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the denominational churches and to other ones. And what we call it is the charismatic movement that came. That people from, from major denominations were all of a sudden becoming spirit-filled in this work. And he said, and after that will come an emphasis on the teaching of God's word and new churches beginning that are teaching the Bible. And, yeah, and that happened, he said, and each will claim that this is the true move of the Holy Spirit. But he said, it's not the revival that had been spoken of in end times. He said, there will come a time when those two will come together. 
and God's power will be seen on the earth like never before. They're not exclusive of one another. They are meant to come together. And that's why the more we know what the Bible says, the less we would be deceived and the more open we are to the genuine working of the Holy Spirit. Because let me help you with something. What's the primary reason that Jesus said? Now here's a trustworthy witness, Jesus Christ. He said, you will receive power. After that, the Spirit of God has come upon you. And what was it for? So that you would be witnesses of me. You and I need to recognize the primary reason the Holy Spirit comes is to give testimony to Jesus Christ, to give us the ability to communicate the gospel and to let people know that Jesus is alive, that Jesus saves, that Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus felt that the ministry of the Holy Spirit was so essential that he told his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise of my Father. This power would come, and therefore, what do you find? In Acts chapter two, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came at 6 a.m. in the morning, he showed up in that room, and all of those believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the point. Did they enjoy that? Sure. Did they experience something that's wonderful? Yes. And here's where you find error in the church today. What people want is an experience. They want something supernatural to touch them, to have an experience with God without recognizing why did it come. You see, by nine o'clock in the morning, at six o'clock, the Holy Spirit came. By nine o'clock, they were ushered out into the street, declaring to the people that were once scared of, the ones that were once threatened them and killed their own leader, Jesus Christ. They were out declaring the great works of God under the inspiration and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will always thrust us out beyond the walls of the church, out into the mainstreams of life who need Jesus so desperately. They're Therefore, if it is the genuine and true work of God, it will always be followed with multitudes coming to know Jesus, multitudes coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why when you see, when God poured out his spirit on the Welch nation, over 100,000 people came to faith in Jesus Christ and so dramatically changed in their lifestyles that they had to retrain the mules in the, in the mines that they mined because the mules only understood swear words because that's all they talked in the mines. And now all these guys came to genuine faith in Christ and they didn't talk like that no more. That's change. That's when you look at it and that's where the problem is. So often we say God's moving and it's just a Christian blessing to come. Because we don't understand, because when you look at it again in Acts, Acts chapter four, Peter and John went back to their own company, having been threatened by the Sanhedrin to no longer preach or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. What did they do? They prayed and the Holy Spirit came and fell upon it so much so that the building where they were praying was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and did what? Went out and spoke the word of God with boldness. It will always usher you out into the needs of our community, into the needs of the people who walk in darkness, who desperately need the light of Jesus Christ. You see, the Holy Spirit always comes with purpose. You grow through the entire books of Acts, you'll always find when the Spirit of God, when the genuine work of God shows up, it always is to glorify Jesus. It always is for the message and the communication of the one true message, the gospel that alone can save men's lives. And whenever we mix it up and make it a bless me club for the people of God, we have misunderstood and opened ourselves up into spiritual error and there Therefore, we can be deceived if we don't understand. And here, listen, when the Spirit of God works, he's always gonna come because see, people will sense his presence. And like I said, the people will respond, but you need to know why he come. 
Let me give you four reasons the Holy Spirit comes and what he's wanting to do because every time he shows up, he's wanting to do something in you. Not just have you experience something and walk away. He came to accomplish something in your life that you could not accomplish on your own. Number one, when the Holy Spirit shows up in our lives, the very first thing he does is take away our fears, all of our inhibitions, all of our excuses, why we don't allow God to move or do in our lives, why we don't talk about Jesus. He comes to remove our fears and all of our insecurities and all of the things that hold us back from what God has called and commissioned us to do in our lives. It's boldness that he brings into our lives, that you can step out of your shell and know that what? The Holy Spirit is with me, therefore God is with me, and therefore who can be against me? He gives me the fear to go out and live the life that God created me to live. Secondly, when the Holy Spirit shows up, he comes often to free us. Free us from things we can't find the freedom of in our own lives. He comes to free us from guilt. He comes to free us from bitterness. He comes to free us from gossip and other things we can't control. But what ends up happening is that we don't allow, we sense the power of God maybe, maybe, but we don't even know why it's here and we don't allow it to work in us to do what only he can do. If it is the genuine work of the Holy Spirit, then you will leave this place different than when you came in here. The chains that once bound you, why you couldn't forgive, now you will have the ability to walk up to someone that you once had issue with. Look them straight in the eye and forgive them because you know you've been forgiven. I can forgive. Why? By the Spirit of the living God who's in me. See, he gives us the ability to do what we can't do ourselves and to free us. Thirdly, he shows up to fill our hearts with love. Why? Because there's a lot of unlovely people in our world. And you know, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can love anyone. You can love the most unlovely people in the world. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. If it is the Holy Spirit, then you're not going to be mean. You're not going to be condemning. You're not going to be judgmental. If it's the Holy Spirit inside of you, then you are going to be just like Jesus reaching out to those who are far away from God and showing them the love of God, real and genuine. The love of God, it comes. See, the love of God will show up in a service to heal relationships that you can't heal on your own. If we would allow the move of the Holy Spirit more in our lives, we would have more marriages surviving in our day. We would have less offended Christians going from one church to another church to another church. Oh, excuse me, I'm stepping on toes. Here's the deal, okay? If we had the love of God living inside of us, we would be less ready to go, forget them, I'm on my way. We would recognize we are connected, we are one body. How can I condemn what God Almighty has worked so hard to bring to himself? You and I realize when the love of, whole, love of God is in our hearts operating, it can restore supernaturally relationships that would not ever be restored otherwise. And fourthly, listen, when it's genuinely the Holy Spirit, when it's genuine, the Holy Spirit, he will always show up to empower you to go do something. So to leave this place and actually accomplish something in your Christian life, to do something that you would not be able to do on your own. But now in the power of the Holy Spirit, you can go out and do what God has called, commissioned and set your life apart for. You see, but what happens is, as long as we just come around it and we want an experience, we don't go away in power to do. We want to come back. We want to keep it right in the four walls of the church and never do anything anything. And therefore, what we do is short circuit the power of God and actually work against the Holy Spirit as opposed to allowing him to do what only he can do. That's why when you know the genuine work of the Holy Spirit, you can look at someone and say, oh, wasn't that great tonight? And you say, well, what did God do in you? See, the word and the fruit of it gives you the understanding, what is God in? And you can know whether it's goosebumps or any other thing that people try to claim is the Holy Spirit, just an emotional high, if you walk away unchanged. There's a lot of crazy stuff that's done in the name of God today. 
And we need to grow up, church, and be mature because why? We need to recognize the true work and ministry of the Holy Spirit so that we will allow him to work in our lives in the way that he was designed and came to fulfill that Jesus told us would happen. You see, when Jesus showed up on earth, the Holy Spirit is like Jesus, okay? When Jesus showed up on earth, all the Jews understood was God the Father. And so Jesus, who was God the Son, showed up and he came into his own and his own received him not. You see, the ministry of Jesus will only impact someone who knows about him, believes in him, and surrenders to him. Is that not true? Did not Jesus die for the whole world? As far as the Bible is concerned, as far as God's testimony is concerned, that every single human being on this planet right now can have a right standing with God, can have a relationship with God. Why? Because the Son of God has already borne the sin of the world, and he has opened wide the door and said, whosoever believes can be made right, can be justified, can have a relationship with God. But what? Are all people saved? No. Because the Jesus' ministry, again, only benefits people who know about him, who believe in him, and who surrender to him. Well, the Holy Spirit is in exactly like Jesus because he's God. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit's ministry will only work in the lives of those who, number one, know about him. And now you understand why there's so much ignorance in the body of Christ. You know, I tweeted this out on social media last night. You really want to make your, you, you, you want to scare the snot out of your enemy? Become best friends with the Holy Spirit. Satan wouldn't know how to handle that. That's why he deceives so many into believing that he doesn't even exist, that he's not a real person, or he gets the other ones to freak out going, if that's the Holy Spirit, it's all right. You can keep that over there. I'm good without that. Because we call stuff the Holy Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit at all. That's just the person. That's just the person. No, God doesn't want you to be like that. That's them, okay? Be you. But allow the Spirit of God to work in you. You see? And so you need to know about him. You need to believe in him. And you need to what? Surrender to him. He'll only work in your lives if you do. So let's turn with me. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. As you're turning there, today is the introduction into this. We're gonna kind of build it as we go over the four weeks that we talk about this. But Jesus, let me give you context. If you're new to Bible reading, first of all, find the New Testament. There are four stories about the life of Jesus written by four different eyewitnesses to the events. We call them Gospels. Find the fourth one, which is the Gospel of John. John was the closest person to Jesus physically, while he was on earth. He had the most intimate, most personal relationship with Jesus. He saw more, experienced more, and Jesus shared with him more than any other of the disciples, okay? And so when John's writing here, John is writing about the, the night in which Jesus was to be betrayed. The night before Jesus was to suffer and die on the cross for our sins. Jesus knew the hour had come, and now he was spending this time with his closest followers, his companions, his disciples, and his apostles. And in this time, we call it, he was celebrating the Passover, we call it the Last Supper. Jesus begins to share the most intimate and most personal, the most important things that his followers needed to know. And what dominates the conversation that night is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus realized, I'm going, and I gotta get into them the most important thing I need them to understand and remember when I'm gone. Because he told them, guys, I'm going back to heaven. And he said, I know sorrow fills your heart when you hear me say that. You're thinking, no way, I need you. I believe in you. It took me all this time to be confident in you. And now you're leaving me? No way. And Jesus begins to explain to them the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so John chapter 14, and look at verse 16. And Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. The word advocate, if you're reading the King James Bible, it's comforter. 
A new King James, it's helper. It's the word paraclete in Greek, difficult to translate because it means so much. We'll cover that in coming weeks. But he said, I will send you another advocate to do what? To help you. See, Jesus is saying, listen, guys, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm providing you the help you need. I will give you another advocate to help you. And he will be with you for a few days. A couple years. No, what does that say? Forever. You know the amazing part about the Holy Spirit? He's so neglected. He's so forgotten about. But he's so committed to his mission. Because he is with us, whether we understand it or not. He wants us to know about him so that we'll begin to walk with him, that we'll begin to fellowship with him, that we'll build a relationship with him. But listen, he came to help us. And Jesus said he would be with us forever. Do you think Jesus was lying? No, the Holy Spirit is on a mission and he won't let go. Look at verse 17. He said, the spirit of truth. Notice he's called what? The spirit of truth, not the spirit of error. The spirit of truth. Now notice what he says next. The world cannot accept him. And why can't the world accept him? Because it neither what? Sees him or knows him. See, people, you ever communicate with people? I know when I've shared my faith, I remember a time when I was talking to this gentleman and people in the world have this idea at times, well, I can only believe in what I can hold with my hands and see with my eyes. I get so frustrated because I was sharing with this gentleman one night and he was telling me this. He's like, no, 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 no. I don't believe in anything that I can't see with my eyes and touch with my hands. And we got to talking about history. I said, do you believe that Abraham Lincoln was the president of the United States, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't know about that. I'm suspect about that because I haven't seen it with my eyes or touched it with my hands. So finally, I said to this man, I said, excuse me, do you have a brain? He looked at me like I slapped him or something. I said, what are you talking about? I said, well, according to what you just said, that unless you have seen it with your eyes and touched it with your hands, it doesn't exist. So therefore, you don't have a brain. And actually the way you're talking, you have proven the case regarding that. But no, you find people and they said, the world cannot receive him because it can't see him. And what, it doesn't know him. But then Jesus said what to his followers? But you what? You know, him. notice he didn't say, but you see him. Jesus didn't say you see him, why? Because when he described the ministry of the Holy Spirit earlier in John's gospel, John chapter three, he said the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He didn't say he is the wind, he's like the wind. Now, how many of you have seen the wind? Nobody has seen the wind, but you have seen the effects of the wind. Now, just because you can't see the wind, do you not believe in the wind? If you don't believe in the wind, go outside the next time there's a hurricane and fare for yourself. Go for it. I don't believe in the wind because I can't see the wind. No, we can't see it, but we know it's there because we see its effects. Jesus was saying, but you what? You know him. We can know the Holy Spirit. We don't see him, but we can know him. We can have a relationship with him. For what? For he lives with you and what? And will be where? in you. Now notice, go over to John chapter 16. Look at this next verse. John chapter 16 and verse seven. Jesus speaking here again says this, but very truly I tell you. Now why would Jesus need to preface his words with, I'm telling you the truth, guys. Did he have a reputation of lying? No, Jesus never lied. But what he's about to say is so mind-blowing that he recognizes when he says it that their natural tendency will be to reject it. That it's not intuitive. It doesn't make any sense. Therefore, things that we don't necessarily understand, we have a tendency to put off. Jesus said, listen, I'm telling you the truth. And what did he go on to tell them? It is good for you that I'm going away. I know their minds are screaming, what are you talking about? It's good for me that you're going away. Jesus, 
Because of you, I have seen blind eyes open. I've seen lame people walk. I've seen bread multiplied. I've seen the people hear the word of God in such understandable ways. I've seen God move more through you than ever. How could it be good that you're going away? I never saw any of that before you came. My life was never like it is today before you came. How Could it be to my advantage that you would go away? And then look at what he goes on to say. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, can Jesus be trusted? He said, I'll go away. He said, I will send him. He's here. But he said, he's more advantageous that I go away. Now, think about it, guys. If Jesus was alive today, physically, he is alive. Don't get me wrong. He's risen from the dead. But he is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. If he was here on earth today, okay? Imagine if all of us got 60 seconds with Jesus. Think about that for a minute. How many people could he see in a day? How many people could he see in a week? Even if he didn't sleep, I mean, he is God, okay? And if he never slept at all, how many people could he see? There are seven billion people people on this planet. How long would it take before you would just get 60 seconds with Jesus? Now do you begin to understand Jesus saying, listen, I want to take away from you all the physical limitations that you put around things. Because the way your minds think, you generally want something you can hold and see. But I want to take you beyond the limits of your mind and show you that God is not limited by your thoughts and your mind. That God is able to deal with every single person on this planet at the same time. That's mind blowing. It always amazes me. You ever stop sometimes in my morning prayer time? I stop for a minute and go, God, I can't even imagine now how many people are talking to you and you're giving me personal attention right now, this is really, when my mind thinks about it, my mind goes, tilt. oh my God, I just blew a hard drive, okay? I can't handle that. And that's the problem. We try to intellectualize God. Can I help you? God's bigger than your brain. You can't contain him. He's beyond your intellect. God is bigger than the smallness of your mind. And he wants to loosen you from your physical limitations to realize that the Holy Spirit coming to you is far more beneficial to you because he's with you always. He's always there. And Jesus said, if I don't go away, he won't be able to come to you. Now look at the next one. Go down to verse 12. In John 16, verse 12, it says this. And I have much more to say to you, but you can't bear it now. In other words, their minds were tilting. (laughs) <laughs> they're already on overload. Do you ever watch when, you're, when people are in some kind of a meeting and they're getting information and they're kind of their, their eyes begin to swim? We have limits, okay? We can only take so much at a time. Jesus said, listen, I am telling you the most important things, but I know right now you are totally limited and what you can understand, what you're gonna retain, but don't worry about it, guys. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear, but what did he go on to say in verse 13? But when he... The spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is to come. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you catch that last phrase? And he will tell you what is to come. Do you mean that I have the potential inside of me of knowing things before they happen? When you allow the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when you become intimate with the Spirit of God, yes, God doesn't call that inside trading. God knows the end from the beginning. In other words, when you allow the Holy Spirit, he'll tell you what's the right way to go. He'll tell you the things to avoid in life. He'll know the end before it even happens. Therefore, if we would learn to listen to him, he would tell us things before they even happen. Do you understand how essential his ministry is to us? If we would learn who he is and how he works, Jesus said, he'll talk to us. When he, the spirit of truth has come, he'll guide us, he'll teach us, he'll show us things even to come. And then look at verse 14. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive 
what he will make known to you. Verse 15, all that belongs to the father is mine. That is why I said he will receive from me that he will make it known to you. So if you're taking notes with me this morning, listen, 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 okay? The success of our Christian walk is entirely dependent upon our cooperation with the Holy Spirit. That's why the enemy wants you to get spooked about the Holy Spirit. Why he doesn't want you to talk about him. Why, or why he wants the false stuff to take your consciousness up instead of recognizing that the Holy Spirit's ministry to us is essential and our success to be who God called us to be, to do what God's called us to do, to walk in what God's called us to walk in is all contingent. It's dependent upon our cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he won't do anything unless we invite him to do it, unless we work in unity with him. So who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? In today's introduction, let me just go over some things on this front, because why? So many people are ignorant about it. So let's cover some stuff. Who is the Holy Spirit? Because as I said, he's the most neglected, the most misunderstood, and the most forgotten of the Trinity. Number one, if you're taking notes with me, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's a person. He's not a force. He's not a mystical, you know, like the guy in the film said, well, it's, you know, this cosmic energy that you're just back absorbed into. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. Jesus said, the world will not receive him. He said when he, the spirit of truth, the personal pronoun he or him refers to a person. Jesus said he would speak to us. Why? Because he's a person. In other words, we can have a relationship with him because he's a person. Okay, he has feelings, he has emotions. The Bible tells us you can grieve the Holy Spirit. He has a mind. You and I need to recognize he's a person with a personality that we can get to know and fellowship with because he's a person. Number two, he's God. That's an amazing thought. Do you know that the Holy Spirit is the first member of the Trinity that gets mentioned in the Bible. Genesis chapter one and verse one says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse two goes on to say, and the earth was without form and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Holy Spirit hovered on the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit is the first member of the Trinity that gets attention or gets what I should say identified in the Bible. And goes, well, no, 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 Pastor Ken. Verse one, doesn't it talk God the Father? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Whoa, whoa, the word is Elohim. And in Hebrew, the word is actually plural. It's the same word in verse 26 when it said, and God said, let us make man in our image. You see, the word Trinity you won't find in the Bible, but the truth about it is there. That's why we need to be astute in this regard and believe because why? It's shown to us. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were absolutely all working in perfect orchestration in creation. And so therefore, when the term Elohim is used, it's often, it's often talking about the work of God, meaning God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, only when it relates to the, a distinct member of the Godhead does it give a responsibility that is given to that one. Now talk about the Trinity for a moment. We see it portrayed in the scripture when Jesus was baptized in water in, Mark, excuse me, in Matthew chapter three, the Bible said that when Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and the Spirit of God descended upon him, listen to me, like as a dove. Now here's one of the goofy things because people say, well, the Holy Spirit's a dove. No, it didn't say he was a dove. It says like as a dove. Do you ever describe somebody who's been, man, he runs like the wind. What are you saying? He's the wind? No, his actions are like the wind and the Holy Spirit's actions are like a dove because why? He's gentle. He doesn't come forcefully making you do things then maybe necessarily you don't wanna do. That's why people say, I couldn't help it. It was the spirit of God. 
Paul the Apostle, in writing to us the most detailed workings regarding the work of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, he tells us quite frankly there that anybody that the Spirit of God moves on has perfect control whether or not to do or not do. And the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So don't lie and say, I, could, I couldn't help it. The spirit made me do it. That's a lie. That was just you showing off, trying to pretend like you're something spiritual. Oops, I'm sorry, I don't wanna. I said I wasn't gonna offend and step on toes. Listen to me. Here's the deal. The Holy Spirit came and God the Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So you see the Trinity right there. Jesus said, go out and baptize believers in, my, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is an understanding of scripture that we come to because when Peter in Acts chapter five spoke to Ananias and Sapphira and says, how dare you concoct a lie against the Holy Spirit? Said two verses later, you've not lied to man, but to God. The Holy Spirit is God. Now we have trouble sometimes understanding how can you be, you know, not three gods past the can, but one God and three personalities. I don't get all that. Some things you just have to accept by faith because why? If you're gonna try to intellectualize and understand God by your mind, then you're starting off at a deficit because you ain't got enough mind for the job. Listen to me. You just gotta realize because the better you understand yourself, the better you understand God. Man is spirit soul and body, but yet one man. But can your spirit and your, and your body be separated? Yeah, because when you die, they put your body in the ground. Then your spirit determining whether or not you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then you go to heaven. If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, you go to hell. But your body and your spirit can be separated. But does that make you two men? No, it's one person. Three distinct parts. Well, let me give you one. Water. Water is what? When scientifically, we know it's H2, oh, two hydrogen molecules, one oxygen molecule make water. Now, is water three parts? No, it's one. But there are three distinct parts of water. God, his signature is all over creation. You just have to accept the truth for what it is. God reveals it. The Holy Spirit is God. And that's a fascinating thought. Listen to me. To know that God is with me and look at the next truth that we need to see is this, that he lives where? In us. He lives in us. Can you imagine God Almighty came to live inside of you? If you became more God inside conscious, you would stop hesitating. You would stop self-doubt. You would stop not doing what God's called you to do, thinking you can't. No, the greater one lives inside of you. You can't, but he can through you. You can do nothing without him, but with him, you can do all things. God God came to live inside of you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. If that concept grew inside of you, you would realize the help you need is right with you wherever you go. No matter what situation you find yourself in, he is right there with you. Why? Because he lives in you. That's why it's amazing. He's like the mysterious one because he lives in the house and he's ignored. Nobody pays any attention. Nobody gives them the clicker to say, hey, what should we watch tonight? No, we don't want to obey the whole. We take him on dates, but then we pretend like he's not in the car with us, if you all know what I'm talking about. No, we allow the Holy Spirit to go absolutely ignored. Now listen to, he's right there when you're fighting with your spouse and we certainly don't give him any attention at that moment because we might, just might shut up and allow God to work and allow forgiveness to flow instead of anger to grow. You can just take that one home with you, okay? Maybe I'll tweet that one out later. You gotta let forgiveness grow. Okay, forgiveness flow so anger don't grow. Listen to me. See, you allow the Holy Spirit to help you. Because listen, the last point you need to understand is this. He is, and I wrote it this way, our neglected helper. God gave us the help we need. And we're always looking for someone else to help us. We do need one another, but listen, we have the greater one in us. 
We have the Spirit of God with us all the time. He came to help us. But listen, why is it we don't want to ask for help? Why can we be so stubborn sometimes when God is there to help us? The Spirit of God. But you see, His help is His way. He comes alongside of us. He doesn't do it for us. The Bible says he takes hold together with us, not for us. He's right there to help us. And God wants us to grow because we're gonna pick up this thought next week. In our following message, we're gonna talk about building a friendship. It's an invitation to friendship with the Holy Spirit. But you see, the Spirit of God is here. And this is, I wanna end with a story to tell you why we need his help. He came to help us to do things we can't do on our own. And we allow him to start working in our lives. It'd be amazed at what God can do through us. We're going to show a movie at the end of the month, okay? The last Sunday of this series, we're going to show a movie that was made about the Holy Spirit, which just released. It's just called The Holy Spirit. And I had a chance to watch a clip, and it was fascinating. And it'll give you another thing, because they want to make a movie to say, we just want to watch. We want to follow the lead of the Spirit of God and see what only he can do. So let me tell you this little snippet of what happened. They were in the city of Jerusalem because it was a cameraman, the writer, you know, the guy that's gonna be editing and put it, producing this, and a guy who was an evangelist. His name is Todd White, was with them. And they were out, and so they were in the Middle East. They're in the city of Jerusalem, and they felt the Spirit of God impressing upon them and speaking to them to say, I want you to go to the Dome of the Rock. Now, if you're not Jewish or if you're not Islamic, you may not even know the Dome of the Rock is the second most holy place in all the Islamic faith. It's the place that Islamic people believe that, Mo, that, that excuse me, um, Muhammad was taken up to heaven from. But to the Jews, it was sacred because it was the place where the Temple of Solomon resided. And in fact, where the Dome of the Rock is was exactly where the Holy of Holies of God, the place where God, when he once dwelt in earth-made temples, before the day when Jesus was resurrected and he rent the veil and said, no longer will I dwell in earth-made temples. But it was the spot, the most sacred spot and to both the Islamic faith and the Jewish faith. It was where they both believed that Abraham brought his child to sacrifice on the top of this mount. And there's the Dome of the Rock. Now, here's the point. They felt this, but it's impossible because no Westerner, no non-Islamic person has ever been into the Dome of the Rock. It's illegal. It's not possible. It is. And so when they went there, they're like, God, I know you're wanting, and God was telling them, I want you to go. I want to be glorified in that place. I want you to, I want you to go in there and I want you to glorify me. And so they, the more they asked around in Jerusalem, everybody told them the same thing. There is no way, that's impossible. It can't happen. And so when they were outside the site area, we we're on in that part of Jerusalem, they looked up and they saw this man that was walking on the street who was limping and was in tremendous pain. They can see it in his face. So Todd White walked up to him and said, excuse me, sir, I can see that you're in pain. The you having difficulty walking? Would you allow me to pray for you? Because the Jesus that I worship heals. Would you allow me to pray for you? Well, the man spoke English. And so he said, okay. And he was open to the end. And so he allowed them to pray for him. And his back was totally out of line. And God, right there on the spot, aligned the man's back and he was healed. Whereby his whole face, he goes, I feel like I'm in a dream. Oh my goodness, my pain is gone. I don't understand what's going on. This is amazing. Thank you. He was so thankful to them. And as he left them, he walked away and they were filming him because he looked at him, man. He was all had a joy in his step and he couldn't believe he was all healed. And he walked down the stairs and he went away. So oh, that was wonderful. Okay, God, thank you for what you did. And so they went into the, the Western part of Jerusalem to the, to the Palestinian section. And they just started to talk to people and pray for people. And all of a sudden, Islamic people, Muslim people started coming from everywhere and they were praying for the sick and people were getting healed. And all this is going on, it's kind of cool. And God is moving in the midst of it. And all these people are coming. And then after this crowd started to dissipate, this man walked up to him and said, excuse me, I'm a Palestinian, but I'm a Christian. And I saw what God was doing in your ministry. Would you come to my home? My father-in-law is sick. In fact, he's dying of an incurable disease. Would you come to my home and pray for him? And so they said, sure, we'll go. And so they went through the street to Jerusalem, came to the man's home, went in, they found his father-in-law who was there. 
And they said, sir, do you mind? We only came here to pray for you. He said, sure, I'm a Christian, pray for me. And on the spot, God heals him. Where the man was having trouble breathing before, all of a sudden, now he can breathe. The pain is all gone. There's joy on his face. He's looking, he's on. And the man who had brought them to his home to pray for his father-in-law, he's crying. And he says to these men, I'm indebted to you for what you did for my father-in-law. Why are you here? What is your mission? They said, we want to go to the Dome of the Rock. He said, well, you know, that's an impossibility. Nobody who's not Islamic can get in there. He said, but I feel so compelled to help you in your mission. I have a friend. And if there's anybody on the face of this planet that could make something like that happen, he's responsible for all of the security at the Dome of the Rock. I'm gonna reach out to my friend because I feel that I owe you, that I wanna help you because of what you did for my father-in-law. I'm gonna call my friend. And so he calls his friend. His friend says, yeah, bring the guys over. They came over to his home. And as the man comes out of his house to greet them, Lo and behold, it was the man that they had prayed for, that God healed him and lost his pain and walked. And he sees them, he's all joyous. And his friend explains to him, these men want to go into the Dome of the Rock. He said, well, you're not Islamic, that's not. But he goes, I don't know why I feel compelled to do this, but I want to help you. So yes, I'm going to make that happen. You will be the first non-Islamic people, the first Westerners to ever go in to the Dome of the Rock. And lo and behold, they went in, they filmed. Even while they're in there, the man said to him, would you like to go to the Well of Souls? That's the most, one of the most sacred spots to, to, the, to the nation of Islam. Listen. It was the place where the Holy of Holies was actually over. And they went down in there and filmed and praised and worshiped God at the Dome of the Rock. Now, how could that happen? You see, you couldn't orchestrate those events to take place. See, the Holy Spirit is here. He's a person. He's alive. And when we build a relationship with him, he's able to do what others say is impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. Can I get to know him? Yes. Can I allow him to become my friend? Yes. What will he do in my life? More than you can even believe. If you will learn his voice and follow his ways. He invites us into the most exciting journey of all. Now do you know why the enemy wants to spook you out about the Holy Spirit? Instead of allowing the true supernatural power of God to operate on the earth.